<laughs> thanks for thanks for the, we're going live now. Now. Yeah. Oh dear, hell, you timed that well saying that. Right, now's the untimely opinion. It's gonna get I'm, them all out. I'm really good at this. We're live now. I've seen it pop up on my phone. Yeah, I've just had the thing. <laughs> it's basically a warning to just shut up if you're saying something inappropriate. <laughs> Don't say something that'll get you fired. Mm. Yeah, subscribe and ring the bell icon and you'll find it out exactly when we go live. Right, I think that's... I for Connor Walker to turn up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't start with that, no. Connor, can we? <laughs> no, he's our number one fan. Exactly. Yeah. He's always on it. We got the same in Monkey See. We've got a guy called Darren who's just on all our live streams and everything. Mm. So. I, I joined your live stream. Was it Tuesday, Tom? Just just as we it? left. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd been out for dinner with my parents. I mean, I'd do it every year I'd, like, on my actual birthday and also the weekend before or after. And as I joined, you sneezed and then the live stream finished. Yes. And yeah, I was that's like, it. Well, like a magic trick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Poof, goodbye. That that was the beginning of uh, beginning of me spending the last few days in bed with the flu. Oh dear, you feeling better? Yeah, I'm feeling a bit better now. Yeah. But, was it uh, was it the c word or was it? No, no. We've I've done several <laughs> I've done several tests. Not that um, c word. Yeah. I know that's what I automatically think think about. Although the c word for me right now is Christmas because it, yeah. it's coming up. It's coming up. <sighs> yeah. You've yeah. you've got a little girl, is that a new George show? Little lad, yeah. Um, yeah, that's half right. Um <laughs> he's he's not quite gone to the stage of being able to like ask and demand for things, but yeah. Here we are, right. I'm I'm worrying over nothing as usual, but right, live edit that bad boy. I tried to send my godson a um a present for his birthday last week, uh or two weeks ago, and it's Carl's son, Killian. And because uh, he's in Ireland now, because of the way Brexit is and everything. And, oh, the, um, yeah. the tax so, everything. Yeah. Um, apparently, his wife was saying that they've ordered loads of parcels. Like they ordered him a a, a two hundred pound coat, and then it got ninety pound duty thrown on top of it. Oh, and then, bloody hell! And then my my parcel that I sent over two weeks ago, I sent it five days before his birthday. Still hasn't arrived yet. Yeah, and so, his birthday was nearly two weeks ago. It's just it's so mad. Thinking, for Christmas this year. What am I going to do? I, I, I've said, what well, I'll tell you what, just pick something that you want to buy him, and I'll send you the cash for it, and you can say it's from me. I think that's probably the only the, way we can really that, do it. Yeah, a lot easier and cheaper. Yeah, that's, that's legit easier. Mm. That's all I can really do because it's I can't keep sending this because they just get keep getting stung with duty all the time. That's uh, incredible. That's that's fifty percent tax, pretty much. That's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it, it's already had sales tax put on it by Amazon. It's crazy. It's just yeah. it's just greedy governments. Well, in in my in my previous job, um, the the HQ for everything was in Cardiff Bay, so not literally five minutes from where I live. Mm. Um, but they've got offices all over the world. They've got loads of offices in Europe, um, and quite often we'd have to send hardware to different offices. So, first of all, when when we shipped to Sweden got stolen when we shipped to France got stolen yeah. and then by the time we actually managed to get them to an office they they wanted to or got a quote to get it to an office in France I think it was uh, they wanted to put so much tax on it it was actually cheaper for us to register an office in Ireland and then use that as our European hub I mean I was a stroke of genius by me because we're dodging a lot of you know tax for shipping stuff but it's just mad at the minute that's that's, that's- Unbelievable! Like that, yeah. I would not believe that if it was just someone randomly sent on the internet. You know what I mean? That's no, it, it, honestly, I, I was, um, you know, I, I didn't deal with it that much because because they had a team that handled that kind of you know shipping and the rest of it, and the stuff I do now is is pretty much global. So we have suppliers that do all that. But it's just like you know, you know, I'd, I'd have people come back to me and say, "Oh yeah, it, it's it, you know, delivery will take like two weeks." But then it's going to be held by customs for like ten days, just to be difficult. And it's always in bloody France that customs get held. Hmm. Aye, this is weird times for sure. Yeah. I just want to get everything sorted and I just relax. But that's what it's like every year, and. Probably can't get to that point until what twenty second, maybe twenty third of December, until absolutely everything's done. Oh, oh well, I'm looking at a graphic here. Go on. 
Hamilton in 2014, every race he finished, mm. he was on the podium. Mm. Yeah, he's done that a few times. Yeah, he DNF'd in Australia, Canada, Belgium. I remember, obviously, Belgium 2014. Yeah. And that was it. Every other race, he finished on the podium. Nobody's ever matched Michael Schumacher's record of finishing on the podium in every race. No DNFs in, uh, was it 2002? Yeah, I think it was 02. Then. And he was only third uh, once every other race. He was first and second. It's ridiculous. But yeah, two absolute, absolute legends. Two of the true greats. But talking, talking about our two title protagonists though today. So are we ready to go, lads? All good, Born yeah. Ready. I've just tweeted it out. All good then. That's a point. We're into the final two races now, and it's all to play for in both championships. But will a new circuit on the Formula One calendar produce any surprises next weekend? Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast, everybody. This is episode number 156, where we're going to be previewing the 2021 Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. I'm your host, George Housen, and joining me today are Tom Horrocks from the Monkey Seat podcast. Hello. Tom Downey from EF1. Hello. And engineer Owain Medford. So, lads, before we get into the show, I'm going to give a shout out to Jay Ritter on iTunes. He's given us a five star review on iTunes. He said, I'm a new fan to F1. I've tried a few different podcasts, but this has to be my favorite. Let's go, Gasly. And he spelled Gasly with a six there. So, yeah, so I've, I think it's a. I think there might be a little spelling mistake for you there, but yes, yeah, thank you for your review. And if you guys leave us a five-star review on iTunes, we will give you a shout-out at the start of the show, just like that as well. And you'll be entered into our competitions, which I will tell you more about as the show goes on. But yes, so we have a fantastic battle this year in the championship, both the drivers and the constructors. But even though there's two races to go and it is still close, I think it's fair to say, Tom, uh, Tom Horrocks, that is, that uh, Hamilton realistically probably has to win this race this weekend. Um, I don't know if he absolutely has to win it, but he certainly needs to finish ahead of Max Verstappen, uh, or it certainly would, would be the ideal scenario. Uh, going into the last race, he needs to make sure that um, Verstappen following, following him home in second place is not going to be enough. And the only way realistically that's going to happen is if he outscores him um, substantially. So uh, it's... Um, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, certainly finishing ahead of him will make things a hell of a lot easier for him. So, uh, so a, a win is the ideal scenario. Plus, we've also got Hamilton's record of of uh, God knows. I don't actually know how many it is now, but the amount of new new tracks that he's won at, the amount of individual tracks he's won at, uh, it would be uh, nice for him to add Saudi Arabia to that on the first time of asking. So, uh, yes, he's. Uh, I mean, the pressure's on, but he's certainly got the momentum. But uh, if you're Max Verstappen, you don't believe in momentum, so that doesn't uh, affect you anyway. So, uh, yeah. Yes, it should uh, he, he definitely needs the uh, definitely needs the uh, uh, rubber the green for this race. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's only an eight point gap, but if it's Verstappen first and Hamilton second, which it has been a lot, it's probably going to be those two right at the front. We don't know, of course, but given how this season's gone with those guys' forms, absolutely. And and you right field point out as well that Hamilton has done very well at new tracks in Formula One. I mean, Qatar was just the latest in a series of brand new circuits that he's won out on the first time of asking um so yeah uh let's let's get on to the actual the track itself though it is a brand new circuit it's a street track in the saudi arabian city of Jeddah. it's going to be a night race but the biggest question for me though tom downey is is the track going to be finishing time um <laughs> i knew that good to me um <laughs> I always give you the easy ones. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's how do I put this? It's a Middle Eastern country with a reputation for getting things done at the last minute. So, whilst it might be in a state of question of whether of people questioning whether it's going to be finished in a week, I think we all know it will be finished in a week. And people will be working, how should we say, around the clock to make sure it is ready. Mm. Oh, what I mean, fundamentally, it's got to be ready for what Thursday when the teams rock up. Even you know, even what before that. Um, although, to be fair, I did see pictures. I think last week or possibly the week before of the circuit, and it looked like the pit buildings were actually finished. 
Um, so it does look like a significant amount of progress was made over the last few weeks. And I know that people were working later into the evening, mainly because of the cooler temperatures. It was easier to work in because I could not imagine working in that heat. Um, I think it will be done. Um, it's just maybe questionable about how it got done in that time. Yeah, I mean, it's fair to say that we do visit some countries that have some questionable human rights, to say the least. And Saudi Arabia, unfortunately, is right up there with those as well. Um, those who are viewing on the on the video podcast will notice a little difference in all of our backgrounds. Uh, we'll probably we'll get into that a bit further on in the show as well. But yeah, they I think Formula One released a video uh, from the Jeddah circuit, obviously probably from a few months ago that it was actually recorded, but the track was nothing like that it looked very much like a half built building building site at that point it was miles off and that wasn't just the the surroundings and the grandstands but also the actual surface the actual tarmac uh it didn't look anything like being done um but the fact that they haven't said anything yet and it is saturday as we record this uh, just over a week to go until the grand prix itself you think that it's going to be done you think they would have cancelled it by now if it was going to be cancelled so it does look like it's going to go ahead for, for better or worse, but it does give us this round and then Abu Dhabi a week after uh, to conclude the championship. Um, but let's just talk about the circuit itself, Owen. Obviously, I mean, for uh, players in the Formula One game will have experienced this track. People who have watched the, the onboard videos as well from the simulations will have seen what this track is all about. It's, an, it's the highest speed street circuit on the calendar, which sounds great in theory, but I think the big problem around here is going to be a real lack of overtaking because there's not many spots to do it. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult. Um, there's not a lot of uh, large breaking zones a lot of the time. Um, I, I, I have a full disclosure, a lot of the uh, a lot of the information I, I've got is from the racing game. So, you know, bearing in mind the validity of some of that, um, which, you know, we've all got our gripes if you've ever played it. Um, but there's, there's not a lot of long breaking zones. Um, initially, the first sector looks all Red Bull. Uh, it's all ch- it's for sort of changes of direction that should suit them. Um, but once you move into the second and third sectors, there's quite long straights, um, quite sort of meandering straights as well. Um, so it's, you know, it, as I say, it's it's there there is um, sort of space for Mercedes to come back there, um, and bearing in mind that they should be running um, Hamilton's uh, Brazil spec uh, power unit uh, rather than a bit of the older one, um, you know, you'd expect them to turn the wick up as well, uh, just because as as Tom said, they they really need to get him in front of Max Verstappen um, wherever he finishes uh, in the points, just so that um, it makes his life easier going into Abu Dhabi. Um, but yeah, I, d- I don't, you know, it's it's quite narrow and uh, and there's it doesn't look like there's a lot of lines for overtaking. So, um, you know, I don't think it's going to be uh, a thriller of a track. But I've been wrong before. Yeah, let's hope that it's an entertaining track to watch the cars race around. I'm just not very hopeful, personally. I think qualifying could be interesting, though. Um, Not least just because there's going to be problems with traffic, people trying to avoid them, but also just because the sheer speed of the cars with very narrow walls. I mean, it's the opposite problem what you have in Sochi. That's walls that are very wide, so it just makes the cars look slow. I think around here, the cars will look incredibly quick, especially with being at night, too. Um, And something else we need to touch on, I mean, obviously, we've, you know, we don't know which way the championship battle is going to go. We keep thinking it's, something's going to happen and it usually doesn't. <laughs> you know, we keep trying to predict it, but it doesn't keep working out. But this season, especially recently, i.e. two weeks ago at Qatar, Mercedes seemed to do very well in cooler temperatures, which although obviously it's very hot in Saudi Arabia, in de- even in December in the day, at night, with being the, Sahara, uh, the Arabian desert, it's going to be very cool. So in that sense, Tom, is it advantage Mercedes going into this one or are Red Bull going to, do well around a street track like they traditionally have done quite a bit well yeah it's got some very similar attributes to Baku which we know was was very uh, very good for Mercedes sorry uh, for Red Bull earlier in the season it could have been good for Mercedes after uh, Verstappen's crash but uh, uh, then brake magic had other ideas um, yeah it's I, I think there's sections of the track that are going to suit Red Bull as as was said earlier and there's going to be sections for Mercedes I just um, on I have to say on Thursday night I had a dream I sound very Martin Luther King but I had a dream that uh, that there, I was watching the race and there was crashes left, right and centre. It was literally like Spa 98, but at every corner. Um, and there ended up being about three finishes. So I, I hope we don't see that. But uh, it's um, 
we we don't know. It's it's very high speed, very narrow. I don't. I think it's probably going to be more like what we saw the first year at Baku, where if we had any support races, which we've got Formula Two, I believe. I think anyone who's looking for some action, watch the Formula Two races there because they're going to be chaotic. But I think the Formula One, because there's so much riding on it, they're going to be erring on the side of caution. No one's going to be taking any risks. Um, so I I don't think we are going to see a huge amount there. Certainly the temperature side of things, I think will suit Mercedes over Red Bull and that. But I do think there is uh, some definite sections of the track that will be suited to that to the Red Bull. Not necessarily the uh, the, the high speed turns because I think uh, it's more the medium and low speed turns that the Red Bull tends to tend to favour. Um, but the uh, certainly the long straights and high speed turns will will suit will suit the Mercedes. So I think overall Mercedes will be the strongest package. Um, the uh, the quote mark spicy engine that they're they're putting in. I think they'll they'll limit that as much as they can because they don't we seem to have a bit of a situation at the moment with the Mercedes where after three races the power unit tends to start developing issues and what they don't want to be doing is they want to be going flat chat in Abu Dhabi they don't want to be nursing any kind of problems so they'll if they've got a strong advantage at Saudi Arabia then I think they'll dial that spicy engine back a tiny bit uh, just to make sure that it has enough punch left in it to uh, to give maximum power at Abu Dhabi because given that Red Bull were very strong at Abu Dhabi last year yes Hamilton was coming back from Covid but even so Bottas was nowhere I, I just think that they're going to need that engine to be at its uh, or their internal combustion unit anyway was going to need to be at its strongest uh, ready for uh, ready for Abu Dhabi but uh, yeah I think overall you're right it probably is going to suit Mercedes just he finishes and uh, crashes throughout throughout the entire race. That sounds like an F one twenty twenty one lob open lobby on uh, <laughs> online. But there we go. Um, it is an interesting point that you raise about the engines, though. Um, you know, it. I, I mean, I've been having this thought, and I, I don't see it being the case, but it could be possible maybe that they'll take another penalty for Hamilton. I mean, it's only five places and it's a brand new engine. It's a bit short time to use it, and it's a hard track to overtake around, but. They've surprised us before with how many engines they've been using. Um, I don't think it's likely, but I think it could happen. We'll have to see what happens with that, though. Um, something that's more likely, though, I think, it, even though despite of Mercedes's potential place advantage, uh, Tom Downey would be uh, Sergio Perez being a real thorn in the side of both Mercedes potentially if he gets a good start or if he qualifies well. Um, you know, we know how well he can run the tires. We know how good he is around street tracks. We all, and we also know how good he is around what will probably be a low grip surface as well. I think he was very good around Qatar, considering. Um, so, could he be a potential deciding factor in this championship this weekend? Um, whether or not, sorry, I'm going to mute my mute my phone. Whether or not he's a deciding factor, I think he could have a significant impact to play um, on on the constructors in general. You know, because because Red Bull and Mercedes are what split by five points, I think, at the moment, something like that. If that, um, the, the point point being, th- th- there's less than ten points between them. Plus, with points of fastest lap and all the rest of it, um, you know, it, it 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 could go either way. And I think at the moment, if I had to put my money on Perez or Bottas to not wrap up, but get the upper hand on the constructors. So I think I put it on Perez at the moment. Um, with sort of like sort of like Red, sorry, Perez in his Red Bull role, I think he's better than Bottas in his Mercedes role because Perez gives Red Bull alternatives because we all know, like you said, George, we all know how good Perez is with the tyres. We know how long he can eke them out. You know, you know, we know he can make just about any circuit into a one stop if he really needs to. The issue, not not even issue, because he has had some very, very good qualifying sessions this year, but we have seen him fail to get into Q3 or go out in Q1 a few times this year. And yes, he's done very well at getting through the field. And yes, Bottas is perhaps not as good at keeping him at bay as we've seen this year. But if Perez can start up the field, you know, get into a good qualifying position, whether that's Second row or even front row, you know, you know, front row even better. But just say for argument's sake, we've got Max and Lewis on front row, which I think we all expect to happen, um, apart from some divine intervention. Um, if Perez can be in front of Bottas or even just behind Bottas, um, he can he can effectively, I don't even know how to phrase this, he can sort of sort him out, just leave the front two to do their thing. 
And then he can almost force Mercedes in, into committing both cars to a somewhat similar strategy. And then and then if if um if Mercedes then try and overcut or undercut Hamilton, they can they can um Paris and sort of just keep you know try and keep him at bay, hold him up, just let them build that buffer. I waffled a bit then, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> it did, yeah. No, it's fine. It, it it's interesting what it's interesting what they're gonna try with the uh, with with the second drivers, I mean, Bottas usually has not been effective at holding up Verstappen, but Perez has held up uh, Hamilton a few times. So yeah, it's um it's an it's an interesting one for sure. Those second drivers, um, but yeah, who do you who do you guys think is going to come out and top of the championships? Is it going to be Red Bull? Is it going to be Mercedes in the constructors? Is it going to be Hamilton or is it going to be Verstappen in in, uh, in the drivers? Just let us know at F1 Chronicle on Twitter. Um, and also, I might as well mention as well uh, that uh, we're running free competitions at the moment, like I've said a few times now. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, F1 Grid Talk, if you comment on the video proper itself, not just the live stream, the actual video itself of, of one of the podcasts, or if you leave us a five star review on iTunes, you can uh, get entered into, you will get entered into a competition to win some merchandise from our store, fronchronicle.com forward slash store. Uh, so let's go on to the next battle in the Constructors' Championship, that between Ferrari and McLaren, which is potentially mostly already over, some would say. But the thing is, if McLaren get a good result round this week, and it could change. However, Owen, I think if Ferrari do get an all right result this week, and like they did in Qatar, I think it's curtains then really for it. Oh, to be honest, I've uh, I've written off that battle. I think Ferrari's nailed third, and. Uh... And, you know, it would take a minor miracle. It would take really good points finishes from McLaren in both of the upcoming races um, to even put that on the table. Um, you know, I, I think the Ferraris have, have taken enough of a step that McLaren um, aren't in the position to catch up. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a boring answer, but, you know, I just I don't see the McLaren drivers, particularly with their drop in form, uh, coming back over the next two race weekends, um, particularly uh, in Saudi Arabia, um, you know, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure really how Saudi Arabia will suit them. Um, at times, you know, they've shown really good straight line speed, um, but other times, you know, they've shown that they sort of can't put it through the twisty corners that you actually, you know, the sort of medium speed corners that you uh, that are going to sort of dominate this track. So, I, and and when it comes to Ferrari, um, I think they've just sort of. Uh, you know they've got the high speed that they can probably deal with what McLaren do. Um, you know the track's very narrow. It's, I think it's going to be difficult to overtake because of that. Um, you know it, it would take, I think, a retirement from from both Ferraris, which is not it won't be unheard of. I, don't, I wouldn't see. So I would say to see both Ferraris go out maybe due to a crash because I think we're going to have definitely some safety cars, a lot of safety cars, um, just because of the the, the narrowness of the walls and. And the speeds that people are going to be going, um, so th- that's the only way I, that I can see McLaren um, coming back and 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 sort of stealing the stealing that third place. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's been a real slip from McLaren in, in form, and they have been unlucky at times. Of course, Lando Norris was very unlucky with his um, uh, with his uh, <laughs> with his uh, with retirement. Well, sorry, not retirement. His puncture in Qatar um, two weeks ago. But at the same time, the form has slipped. It's been uh, Norris was in third place, comfortable third place for a good part of this season. Now he's only one point ahead of Charles Leclerc and not that much ahead of Carlos Sainz either. Um, but how do you reflect on Claren's season this season, Tom uh, Tom Horrocks? Because it's it's an interesting one. I think they've actually scored more points. I mean, I think they've got we do obviously, obviously more slight have slightly more races than last year, but I think they have scored more points than last than last year. So there is that, and they have got their first win. But it is disappointing that it's looking unlikely they'll get third in the constructors again this year. Yeah, I don't think it's quite as doom and gloom as it as it appears on paper. I mean, after seven, we had seventeen races last year. After seventeen races, McLaren had scored more points than they had done the previous year. They've continued on their upward trajectory, which is outscore that you know improve every year and they've definitely improved every year given that they were also hamstrung a little bit by the regulations this year in that they had to integrate a new power unit into the uh in, in, into that car which meant their development tokens had to be spent on that and the relative performance gain versus uh what they would have been able to do aerodynamically i think you'll you'll probably see it's probably not been 
that vast. I mean, we've seen this year just how far the the Renault power unit is behind the others now. They just in the this entire turbo hybrid era, they'd never once managed to catch up. So it was 100% the right decision for the future to move on to this um, this Mercedes power unit. Um, or I mean, perhaps you could say the best decision would have been not to leave the Honda in the first place but even so you know that that's where they are and they're now with this uh with this Mercedes power unit can that mean can they ever challenge Mercedes I'm not entirely convinced as to that um although we are seem to be losing different pe- you know high profile people from Mercedes every day at the moment as uh, another one has gone to Aston Martin recently but um but to get back to McLaren their their overall season definitely an improvement Ferrari were always handicapped last year you know they they were they were they were unproportionately handicapped last year compared to any other year uh given uh i'm not saying it's not fair but given what was allegedly happening with their power unit um that's was kind of like a punishment year for them so mclaren were kind of forced ahead of them in that fight i mean realistically that fight last year would have been for fourth place not third place between them and racing point so uh the fact that they came third was a bit of an overachievement and i think they'd have gone into this year expecting ferrari to be a lot better expecting aston martin to be a lot better than they were um not not knowing how these new regulations were going to affect every team so Given that they started in third place and and they looked like they were good for that third place, I think would have been an overachievement again for them. I think their business model would have been set out for a fourth place finish and that would have been their target. And third place, obviously they're gonna fight for it and they're still gonna fight for it till the end of the season, but I don't think it's gonna I don't think it's it's gonna cause them to have to remortgage if they if they finish fourth or anything like that. I don't think it's gonna make any major effect on their on their overall season and if they base it a success or not I think whatever happens from here on out it's a successful season it just would be a little bit of a shame for the guy that was in the conversation for third uh, in Lando Norris ends up finishing potentially what seventh visit he'll end up finishing now if he finishes behind the two Ferrari guys which looking at the moment looks highly possible um, I do agree that you know even if uh, we have my, my dream comes true, uh, my my nightmare comes true, whatever it was, and we have all but two cars finishing the race, and those two cars happen to be the McLarens. Even with a one-two, that would that I still don't think that would be enough for them to k- take that third place in the championship. So because I just think Ferrari have got too much in hand, and they would outscore them in both races, and that would only put them back on an even keel with them just slightly ahead. So it's it's just too big a gap. So uh, yeah, it's 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 still a successful season. They're still building. They're still moving forwards, and it is is always going to be about next year. I just hope that they haven't done made the same mistake they made in two thousand and eight and put all their eggs into this third place basket and uh, and compromise next year's car. Because as long as they've they've got what they want for next year and they've they've put everything into that next year, then they can be right up there with the Ferraris, uh, Mercedes, and Red Bulls next year. Because uh, I I think there's only a handful of teams that can make that jump, and that's potentially Alpine and McLaren are the only two with the with the resources to make that jump into a title winning car next year. Just my opinion. Don't at me. Uh, but that's just what I think. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, I, overall it's still a successful season for McLaren and Ferrari can be very, very happy with the progress they've made. But uh, it's kind of, I mean, I predicted them at the start of the season, they'd finish second, but that's when I thought Red Bull were re-signing Albon. So uh, that, that's why. But uh, yeah, once we started the season, they looked like they were nailed on for fourth or fifth. So uh, Ferrari have definitely, uh, definitely risen to the challenge but McLaren cannot feel too disappointed with their progress yeah McLaren have, have improved and I, and I think the thing for McLaren at the end of the day as well as Daniel Ricciardo I think is finally finally on all cylinders don't get me wrong he does have the bad race every now and again but I think he is better on the whole I think he's a lot more used to that car which is good news for them for the future um uh, also good news for a team is Alpine now they got another podium uh, last time out in Qatar, Lonzo getting his first podium since his comeback. His first podium for seven years. First time he's on the podium, I think, since Hungary in 2014. Uh, a very, very long time. Many, many races have been done uh, since then. So great to see him, a great champion, back on the podium, back on in the top three. And for Alpine, Tom Downey, it's, it's very good for them because... That really does give them a massive boost for fifth in the championship in the constructors, which is something that until very recently I didn't think was going to happen because Alpha Tauri looked like they had the faster car, but Alpine they keep getting the results. Yeah, I gotta be honest, I thought Alpha Tauri were gonna be more or less nailed on for fifth in the same way that I thought McLaren were gonna be nailed on for third. But 
this 2021 season just keep keep throwing curveballs left, right, and center. Um, obviously, uh, Alonso had a really good qualifying session, and we know how good he is at getting a lightning start, and we saw it again last Sunday. Um, you know, especially, especially, you know, he got such a good lightning start. I thought he was going to push Verstappen off at one stage, um, but the two of them just, you know, just kept just about enough between them. Um, there was enough sort of racing respect, if you like, between them to not not have a coming together. But yeah, it, it was it was huge for Alpine, and in a weekend where I think certainly going into the race, I thought it was going to be advantage AlphaTauri because they're both drivers in the top ten. I was expecting to see both drivers finish at the top. Uh, well, sorry, not at the top, in, in the top 10, in the points. Um, only for Gazi to get done by Saturday and Sonoda to do what he does best um, and just die, basically, in, in the race. Um, you know, it's a, it was a pretty big point swing because they were, I think they were even on points. And I think Alpine were only ahead because they would had a higher place finish. Or, 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 they, or they'd had obviously they had the race win with Ocon, so I think I think that was what put them ahead in the constructors initially. But now that they've ta- they've taken a huge chunk of points to um to sort of get a stranglehold on fifth in the uh, in in the constructors, and unless one of the unless unless the Alpines have a double DNF or something, um, I can't see AlphaTauri getting back enough points because. Aston, uh, sorry, not Aston. Uh, Al- Al- Alpine with with Fernando Alonso, you're going to get some good results, even if they might be sometimes a bit unspectacular. And let's not discount Ocon as well. He's, you know, they've done pretty well between the two of them. And I don't think Gasly is going to do enough uh, because let's be real, I don't think Sonoda is going to be there every race. But again, next week is an unknown, so who knows? Um, but I'd say based on how things have gone so far, I would say. Alpine are probably locked on for uh, for fifth. Yeah, yeah, and, and you were right. Yeah, they were um, they were even on points. They're even on 112 points before Qatar. Uh, AlphaTauri, despite their incredible pace and in qualifying and and practice as well, didn't score any points because of the strategy. So Alpine took a 25 point haul, 15 for Alonso, 10 for Ocon because he got fifth. Ocon did a very good job as well. Uh, he fought like a lion. Well, it was asked to fought, fight like a lion anyway by Alonso in in, in the race during that one. Um, but th- this is the, this is the thing going. Like I, th- I don't think anybody's going to dispute the fact that AlphaTauri have a better car than Alpine. But it's just it's getting the results because something always gets in the way, and it's not always Sonoda. It's not always Sonoda's lack of pace that stops from getting a double point score. It's also the strategy they need to sort that out because they could they could have an incredibly fast car again around Jeddah. I think they probably will to be honest given their form but they need to have a good strategy otherwise they're just going to get stuck in traffic yeah it's pretty easy to lose a race like that and uh and yeah, in some ways it's reminiscent for me of uh of the fact that you know fernando alonso is consistent enough and good enough that uh you know he can take a much work he can take a car that is objectively worse um and uh and mix it up with a, a red bull of some description um even if it's a little bit further down the grid than it was last time um like it's i, I think the thing is alpha Tauri have the potential huge potential like they could be mixing it up um with mclaren and ferrari uh if they were executing things properly um but the fact is that unfortunately just through driver error um strategy failures just and sometimes just bad luck um you know and and on the other hand some very very good luck uh for for Alpine Renault that they've you know kept themselves in in a close enough position in in a number of places that they can actually um take those results when they come to them I think it's uh it's almost you know that they're they're two sides of the, that they're uh, so not two sides of the same coin, but you know that Alpine are doing everything that uh, Alpha Tauri should be doing. You know they're capitalising on mistakes of others, um, and and they're making sure that they take a car that is worse and getting the absolute maximum out of it um, a lot of the time. Whereas Alpha Tauri have a car that seems to be quick, and we've seen it time and time again through various different sessions at various different circuits. Um, but unfortunately. Uh, they're not executing that potential correctly, uh, and it's just it's disappointing to see. Um, and I th- I think it's probably cost them um, 
what could be, you know, what could have been a very good finish this year. Um, I hope it, go, it goes better next year and that they, they get on top of these strategy worry, uh, strategy issues and that Sonoda comes back stronger next year because otherwise it's, you know, it's going to be another long year and Alpine could have stolen a march on them by then, you know, and, you know, potentially Williams and, and Aston Martin as well. Um, you know, they, they, it's the sort of thing they need to cut out uh, because otherwise it's, you know, it's, it's a rough, it's looking at a rough old time. Yeah, it is. That's the thing. They do have a good car. They've got a great engine in the back of it. Um, something that's all, you know, always eluded them. They've never finished in the top five in the constructors. Sixth is the, would be the joint highest uh, they've ever had, which is great. Obviously that, that in itself is good for them. Even, I think even when they won a race last season with Gasly, I think they were still only seventh in the constructors then. And they wouldn't have beat it, that record um, when Vettel won his race for Toro Rosso back in 2008 as well. It's, it, has, it has been a very impressive season for them, but it's been a, also a season of massive missed opportunities for them. Um, something that could also be said of Aston Martin as well, Tom Horrocks, but at least in Qatar, they got some good points. I mean, I, I've said it a few times, I've not been on a show since the Qatar Grand Prix, but Lance Stroll in sixth place, I think that's an extremely impressive drive. Nobody was really talking about it. And here he is dra- dragging a, a low midfield car that high when they would have focused on next year well before then. So could they pull out another surprise in Saudi Arabia next week? Well, it's not going to affect their overall position of the championship. They're nailed on for that seventh place now. But uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with Lance Stroll's performance in in the last race. Very, very under the uh, um, under the radar. I have to admit, on the on the race review show for Grid Talk, when they got down to Lance Stroll, I was like, did I just doze off and we missed out an entire section of the grid? Why are we talking about Lance Stroll so early? Uh, I'd completely forgotten that he'd even come sixth. So yeah, it, it, it was a. I mean, there was obviously circumstances that that led to that, but uh, even so, it was a keep your nose clean type of drive from Lance and uh, with that car being the seventh quickest car and Lance Stroll regularly scoring or not regularly but occasionally scoring like eighth ninth and tenth places and then this one sixth he's kind of putting that car you know slightly below where it should be uh, with a bit of attrition and then Sebastian Vettel is putting it pretty much where it should be so uh, it's they've they've obviously sacked off the season very early they haven't had a double points uh, double point score since when was it uh, like I think race six or race race eight something Tom, like they that. Got, they got they got double points in Qatar. I'll stop. Yeah, there. yeah, but apart <laughs> from, but apart from yeah, I mean apart from that, you know what I mean. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's. You t- completely derailed me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, mate. I had yeah, to yeah. say it because if I didn't say it, somebody else would. Yeah, no, absolutely, out. absolutely. Yeah, no, it's fine. It has been a very but long it's, time. Yeah, yeah up, up until that, it was say a very very long time before. So they they've obviously turned off turned off development very early on um, because things just weren't going well. So yeah, I don't think they they've got nothing to fight for now for the end of the season. They're they're well ahead in the uh, in the constructors ahead of uh, ahead of Williams who have also switched off uh, and they're uh, nowhere near nowhere near Alpha Tori. But uh, again, they they should have been. And it's been really a, a very a very difficult season for them in that sense. And I know they've they've you know they, they were talking themselves up at the start of the season, and you know we're going to be winning championships, and not so much this year, but you know there's going to be the progression there. And people were even saying, God, Aston Martin are looking good. And I have to admit, I even bought into the hype a little bit. I thought, yeah, they were going to be up there. I mean, I did predict at the start of the season they would be sixth, but. Um, I didn't expect them to fall this far, and I expected them to be, uh, you know, at least in a fight there. Uh, but I thought it'd be a lot closer than it is. So yeah, they, they, I don't think they're they're in for a bumper season. I think just the the, the punches and and everything else that happened, all you know, on the face of it, realistically, they would have only got their usual ninth, tenth place at the end of the last race as it was. So uh, I don't see it as. Um, as like a renaissance for them for the season but uh yeah they're just kind of like just seeing the season out now really it's uh it's it's not they're not going to create many headlines now unless unless Vettel can uh, drag it up to another podium and hopefully not get disqualified this time <laughs> yeah that one's still very fresh in the memories that for for a lot of people but even with even without that disqualification or they still would be down in seventh there'll still be a ways off Alpha Tauri in sixth uh, but yeah, you're right. It, it, you can't really see them doing too much. Maybe Stroll and Vettel would be able to run the tyres long, get a lucky safety car or something. You never know, they could get decent points, but they're not going to get up to six. That's, that, that ship has well and truly sailed. But they are at least set, uh, safe from the eighth place team, which are Williams, another team that have improved a lot this season. Uh, but again, have not had a point score for, for a while now. Obviously nowhere near as long as the weight they had before they got those points in Hungary this year. Um, but at the end of the day, 
all their emphasis on next year. However, the car is usually not too bad to qualify. It's going to be very hard to pass around uh, Saudi Arabia as well, uh, Tom Downey. So maybe, just maybe, George Russell could pull something off. Or oh, all the Latifi for that matter. You know, Latifi has not had a bad season at all, really. Yeah, um, you know, we saw sort of even before coming into the season, we saw that Williams were setting up their car for more peak downforce, which is always going to favour qualifying and then have a bit of a detrimental effect in the race, which I think is safe to say we've seen a few times this year when Russell has got it up into these higher positions and then sort of slipped back in the field and to a lesser extent the Sifi as well. Um, I think I think Jed, uh, I can't remember what the first name of the track is, but let's call it Jed. I think Jed is going to be it's going to be a bit like Monaco or Hungary, where track position is going to be key. Um, so qualifying is going to be pretty imp- well. You know, it's always important, obviously, but it's going to be even more important this weekend, uh, next weekend, even. Um, just sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, uh, track position is going to be super, super important in in, in qualifying. Um, if the Williams can at least hold on to a position at the start, you know, if if they manage to get one car into, into Q2, which isn't out the realms of possibility, you know, especially if that Mercedes power unit, if it is even half as good as how it is in the back of the Mercedes works car, it should give them a decent shove down the straight. Whether they'll actually get points, though, I don't think so. Um, I think what we saw in... Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. What we saw in Hungary was a bit of a freak result because look at the rest of the race around it. You no, know, we had bowling ball Bottas at the start um, that took out one and a half of the Red Bulls, um, and then it just flipped the race on its head. Ocon lucked into that position, and it just meant the order was jumbled up. We had a hass in the points for God's sake, um, you know. So you know, it, it was it was very much a. You know, it was very much a sort of um, left field, left field race, and I think that was how uh, I think Williams were almost a bit lucky to get those points. But to draw Russell podium in uh, in Brazil, yes, okay, if you take the the race out of it from uh, not Brazil, Belgium, even you would take the race result and use that the inverted commas out of it. He still put that car P. Was he P two, P three, in Belgium? He was second, yeah. Yeah, he was second. That's right. Yeah, you know, he still put it P two in the wet. Mm. You know, a, you know, a car that has you know not been that far down the grid since. Uh, sorry, not that, not that, um, not that far out the grid since about twenty eighteen with Stroll or twenty seventeen with Stroll. Um, and and then, obviously that. You know that that race that wasn't a race. You know, I think that probably artificially inflated their points a fair amount. And I think if we'd have had a race, a proper race there, even if it, you know, even if it would have been on the safety car for say twenty laps, we would have seen Russell slip down the order a lot more. Um, hmm. And going off that and going off re- re- recent results, um, it looks like Williams have stopped development for twenty twenty one altogether. Which I don't blame them because I think, well, I'm sure I've said it before, they're not going to catch. Aston Martin in P7 or, or whoever's in P7 at the moment. And realistically, Alfa Romeo are not going to catch Williams. So there's no point wasting resources, you know, both financial resources, you know, human resources, all the rest of it, into developing the car for the rest of 2021 when, they, when everything is completely overhauled next year. Um, I don't blame them for basically... Basically saying, right, we're done with 2021. See the season now. Obviously, George is going to go into Mercedes next year. They're not doing the end of season test um, for reasons. Uh, you know, I think is the best way to put it. So, I'm, I don't, I don't expect much from them uh, this this weekend. As, as, har- as harsh as it sounds, I think qualifying, like I said, it might they might get a decent quality result for Williams. But it's probably not going to be anything to phone home about. And if we have a race without incident, which I think we might, um, they're just going to end up getting swallowed up by the pack. Yeah, despite, despite some of the results they've, they've produced throughout the season, you know, and some of the qualifying performances in particular of George Russell, it is unlikely that 
Williams will score points. It is possible, of course, but it's unlikely. And I think it's probably even more unlikely that Alfa Romeo are going to score points this weekend, Owen. It's, although saying that, Kimi Raikkonen, he has been producing some decent performances. He has had a few eight places to kind of get Alfa Romeo a bit closer to Williams, but there's still 12 points off, which is more points than what they have already. So I think the whole team really is looking forward to 2022 and both their drivers are looking forward to leaving. Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, technically it's possible, uh, but it would, like you say, it would be it would mean over doubling their points tally uh, currently, which is highly unlikely um, within two races, let alone one. Um, you know, it could, it could be a case if they get the setup absolutely perfect and, you know, manage to profit off a lot of safety cars and things like that, but or, or incidents or anything like that. But um, I don't... I don't see that happening. Um, I don't. <laughs> I honestly don't think they've got the luck for it. And I don't. You know, it's. You know, as, as has been discussed at length, really, it's. There's not much more for our, for the drivers currently in Alfa Romeo, you know, and Kimi and, and Giovinazzi to do. Um, you know, Kimi's leaving. Um, so you know what prerogative? Like, it's got to sit in the back of your mind. I'm sure he's the you know ever the professional, but it's got to sit in the back of your mind of. There's no real point to be to do this apart from to fill the contractual contractual obligations, and Giovinazzi is probably feeling the same. You know, he's he's looking to go to you know he he's got a, a, a career in Formula E to try and make something of. Um, and again, you know, it's it's the last to him. It's you know, it's going to be the last time probably for a while, if at all, uh, that he he drives a Formula One car. So there's again, there's not that. I, I can't imagine there being that drive to go and. Um, sort of trying to steal steal that eighth place off off Williams and 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 even if there was I don't think they could do it anyway um so I think it's just you know t- t- somehow don't lose 11 points to Haas is ultimately their goal um for, for the last two races and and I I think that's fairly easy for them to avoid yeah I don't think it's gonna be difficult for them <laughs> No, I I, I, th- I think they've got that one sewn up, really. I think they're going to get ninth place. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't see how Hass are, uh, are going to be able to um, <laughs> score any points, let alone 12. I, it's just it's just not happening, really. Um, but, yeah, uh, Tom Horrocks is an absolute, um, absolute warrior. You know, he's not feeling particularly well at the moment, but he's still come on the show today. And just to make him feel a little bit better, now it's your time to talk about Hass, Tom. So how, how do you think... How do you think Haas are going to get on this weekend? Ah, uh, yeah, great. <laughs> can, I, can, can I go back to bed now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, if, if I could just dive out very slightly, I've just got that nice little tidbit I've just noticed while looking up trying to find something interesting to talk about for Haas. Um, I just noticed something which I did not realise in that if you were to pick one team on the grid, who do you think has finished the most races as a team this entire season? I probably would say Haas because they're so far at the back, they don't get tangled up with anybody else. It's not Haas, but that was my initial thought, thinking, oh, well, they've only had six retirements, or four of which have is been it massive. Alpha? Have been. Alpha it is Alpha. Yeah. You guess they've had one retirement all season, and that was Kimi Raikkonen in, in, in Portugal. Every, they finished when every other race. Teammate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but they finished every other race. So uh, it's not often I kind of volunteer to talk about Alfa Romeo for obvious reasons. At least at least Haas have got, you know, something tangible you can get your teeth into, whereas Alfa Romeo are just like, just like a blancmange, really. There's just nothing about them. But um, but with, with regards to Haas, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, they... Their, their only hope would have been uh, if they could luck into a reasonable points finish. But can you see them scoring 11 points? <laughs> no, uh, they, they've got nothing, really. They're, they're only... I mean, even Mazepid now, bless him, has gone back to his his old chassis, the one that was, you know, a, a lot heavier and wider and, and, you know, it might even offer him a little bit more stability than the, than the current chassis they've got because um, you go on board with that Haas and uh, it's just an absolute nightmare. And I watched the, uh, the onboard from the start of his race in Qatar just because I thought, I want to see what happens in a race from Mazepan's perspective at the start of a race and I went on the onboard all through the formation lap and everything and it was all all looking great all looking grand um, and there was a slight tyre offset in his defence in that Mick was on the softs and he was on the mediums but just from the start he was he was 10 metres behind before they'd even you know before they'd even finished off um, you know the first phase of the start they get down to the they get down to the um, the first corner and he's 
he's nowhere near even a possibility of overtaking. And then he goes through turn two and then he goes off the track completely on his own. And again, it's because the car just snaps for, for absolutely no reason, seemingly. And then, you know, he's he's a fair distance behind by the end of the first lap. And that car is just an absolute nightmare to drive. And, you know, we all have a good laugh at Mazepin. And for, you know, for a lot of the time it's deserved as well for, for good reason. But that car looks like an absolute dog. And, uh, and... In the hands of Mick, it doesn't look great either, but particularly with his chassis, uh, for the last few races, he is going to be behind by a country mile, and uh, and he's going to be an absolute laughing stock. And you know, it 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 can't be fun for him at all. I mean, you know, it's you know, my heart bleeds for him, but you know, it's not it's not going to be fun, and he it is going to be. Just how many times is he going to be lapped? How much is he going to be getting out of people's way, particularly him and. Uh, and and Mick, as I say, is not going to be particularly much better either, because it, you know it's it, it's just it's just not going to suit them in any sense whatsoever. There's absolutely nothing that they're fighting for now. They're short on parts. They've had no upgrades all season, and they've got no points. They won't get points. There's absolutely nothing to fight for. I mean, there's even uh, I saw a story this morning about. Dimitri Mazepin is is on about bringing in an incentive scheme for the for the uh, for the engineers, like if if they score points or if they get better performances. And it's like that's not going to help. You know, what you're going to do? You could offer them a million for a point. It's not going to make that car score a point. It's it. It's just like it's like fighting with one hand with both hands tied behind your back. It's it's, it's like the, uh, the 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 Black Knight in uh, <laughs> in that Monty Python film, yeah. you know, he's just jumping around with no arms. <laughs> it's only a flesh wound. It's fine. We can still win this race. So no, it's there's absolutely nothing that they can fight for now. So yeah, it's just get to get through these last few races and uh, and just go again next year. But even next year. What are they going to do? They've not. This car is effectively the same car from 2019. Can, are you seriously telling me they've got a car that's going to uh, in their back pocket that Delara have designed in conjunction with various other people? You know, in this IKEA plug and play type car that they've got, <laughs> it's not going to. It's not going to jump forward. I mean, it will. It will certainly be better than it is at the moment, but it's not going to jump into the midfield or anything like that. I just hope, for the sake of competition, it can be you know, in with a chance of not being the last car at some races. Uh, because, and genuinely, I would like to see Mazepin in a better car. Because, let's be honest, if he's if he's at the back there and just, just getting lapped left, right and centre, getting in people's way, blue flags and stuff, that's no good for anyone. If We need to know mm. if he's actually any good. And if he's in a better car and he's fighting with people on track for position, for points, then we'll know if he's a decent driver or not. Because at the moment, there's always that question mark of, well, is it the car? You know, the car's so terrible. In the same way that people say about Hamilton and Verstappen, it's just the car. There's no, you know, you put him in a Haas, they'll never score points. I want to see him in a better car next year. I want to see Mick in a better car next year because there's always the whole... Um, question mark about you know his lineage and everything and and is he just there because of his dad's name and nepotism and all that so i want to see the has get better next year because i want to see them fighting for points just to see how good they are because they are the there's no barometer for those two whatsoever we don't know how good they are and i want to know so yeah that's that's kind of that's that's ass for you i would managed to talk about them for a bit <laughs> He did a very good job there. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, that's that's more than I could ever talk them, talk <laughs> talk about them for. That's uh, yeah, that, that's the thing for them at the end of the day. That their season was written off before it was almost begun. I mean, they, they were never going to upgrade the car. It's not changed at all. And because of everybody else upgrading their cars, it's just got steadily and steadily worse as the season's gone by. The, that I mean, the, the most exciting thing for them, or at least for us, the viewer looking at them this weekend, is them potentially holding the leaders up because it's a very narrow track. It's very high speed. And they're very slow, so they're probably going to see the leaders at least twice as they're lapping them. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see what happens with that one. Um, but do not expect anything from Haas. I mean, it's enough of a stretch to ask Williams and Alfa Romeo to score points. Haas is just not going to happen. They haven't scored anything all season. And for a team that was fighting for fourth place in what was it, 2018, something like that, this it's just an unbelievable drop off. It just shows you how quickly it can all turn around in Formula 1 for good and bad there's been some real good stories this season with teams doing a hell of a lot better like Ferrari and Williams but Haas are definitely one of the bad stories in how much they've slipped um, let's not forget Haas finished P6 on their debut in Australia in 2016 mm, yeah 2018 as well they got a fourth and a fifth at Austria yep almost got a podium so they've had some great results it's just there's been this last few years just 
wrong decision after wrong decision after after bad all, Ferrari engine. It's just it's just all compiled for him, hasn't yeah. it? It all started with rich energy. It did. <laughs> it actually did. <laughs> yeah. That's where I think it they, started. They showed the uh, they showed what what model the, a new team needs to use to come into Formula One to make it affordable and yeah you know, just going in with this buy as many parts as possible integrate yourself in with another team you know they were in with Ferrari for a whole year learning about how to drive the cars and they had so many innovations and things from Ferrari that they could have used in that debut season which filtered through for the second season but if you look that their cars kind of basically gone backwards since since they came into Formula One and that's it's a great way to come into Formula One but then you've got to invest in the infrastructure structure because if you buy that team what are you buying you're buying a warehouse in i don't know is it banbury they're based or somewhere but you're just buying a warehouse in 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 a in an industrial estate and you're not really buying a formula one team because you're buying a, a chassis that someone else has designed you're buying an engine that someone else has designed you're buying listed parts that they're buying from somewhere else so you're buy you're buying the entry into formula one so you're save, saving yourself is it 200 million the entry fee to enter formula one now for a new team it so is, that's yeah. all you're doing when you're buying a buying hass so that means they're probably worth 201 million yeah, it's tricky. I mean, it's better than nothing. It's better than starting a, a team completely from scratch. But I do take your point. Yeah, it's not a complete team. If, you know, that it's not the whole. It's not the whole thing. They don't make their own engines either, obviously. So that's that's no big cost for you. Um, but yeah, those are all ten teams. Those are a lot of the drivers we spoke about as well uh, during the show. And now it's time to get into our predictions. And I think I honestly think Mercedes will probably have the edge this weekend. I, they seem to do well around cooler tracks i think it will be a cooler race despite obviously being in saudi it will be at night time so it should be relatively cool by f1 standards just like qatar was uh, a week ago so i'm gonna go with hamilton for the win and i'm gonna say that he'll get the fastest lap and i'm gonna say verstappen in second which will put them equal on points going into yas marina i do think that could genuinely happen but i think if hamilton does win i think it's more than likely that someone else will take the fastest like whether it's verstappen or perez i don't think the guy who wins the race will get the fastest lap just because of the gaps they're gonna pit someone with a few laps to go put the softs on go for a hot lap and they just take the fastest lap point away so i don't think whoever's going to win is going to get the fastest lap but i would like to see that happen and third place, again, just because I think Mercedes have got the edge over Red Bull, I'm going to go with Valtteri Bottas. So, uh, Ham Bot there. I'm sorry, no, Ham, Ham there, Bot, nearly the classic. Those three guys, though, have been on the podium a lot together. Um, Tom Horrocks, what's your top three predictions? Strap yourself in, lads. This is going to be... <laughs> it's going to be a bumpy ride. 6,175 <laughs> metres of pure carnage. Uh, I'm I'm going to go for a Mercedes win, but it's going to be Valtteri Bottas getting the inaugural victory. We're followed in second by Sergio Perez with Lando Norris completing the podium. <laughs> uh, Verstappen and Hamilton taking each other out? Uh, certainly not going to be in the top three. I think there's going to be something going on there, whether, whether it be with them both or whether it be separate incidents. I think there's going to be something. This title battle has has gone on so long that something is going to happen just to just to energize it that one more there's one more twist because when we go to Abu Dhabi you know um this just track changes aside there's not really going to be anything exciting happening there we, we don't imagine so I, I I think there's there's still space for one more twist in this championship whether it be Hamilton riding home fourth um to to bring that that gap down to a to a narrow uh, to a narrow gap going into the final race with Verstappen out the race I'm not sure but uh I just think that it's we're going to have a bit of a crazy race um and but probably not for good reasons it's probably going to be non-racing reasons that make it crazy right okay well, you never know anything's possible anything can happen in formula 1 and it usually does uh Tom Downey what's your predictions um I'm a bit thrown now because Tom you really put me off then <laughs> <laughs> just like this way you said Bottas was like what? Um, yeah, wasn't expecting that. And I think Bottas probably be about seventh. Um, no, I, I I don't want him to because I want my boy Max to obviously win the title. But I do think Hamilton will win. Um, I think I think Max will come home P two and pick up the fastest lap. As for P three, anybody's guessing it. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to say Perez I've got face alright All right. so Owen what's your pick for your top three I'm going to go Hamilton win and then 
I'm imagining, oh no, Bottas has accidentally hit Verstappen because you wouldn't ooh, leave it till the last ooh. race to do it. Um, Cynic. Yeah, you, Cynic. Wouldn't leave it, you wouldn't leave it till the last race to do it. Uh, you know, he's just locked up. Break magic again. It's weird that we took it off that tog, uh, off that uh, you got to hold it down thing that we've that they've changed it to now. Uh, and then, so, you know, so you get Perez second and then let's go Leclerc third. <laughs> It does, it does seem like there's going to be something that happens, whether it's this weekend, whether it's next weekend, and every day that. It does feel like there's going to be there's going to be one more incident. There's it's one more really, in there. It's going to be in the final race. Tricky. It's, you know, it's going to be in Abu Dhabi. There's going to be something that happens in Abu Dhabi. They have to both of them have to just try everything, especially if they're like level on points. Whoever's behind has nothing to lose at that point. Right. I just just had a thought. Imagine the scenes. Right. Hamilton wins and gets fastest slap next mm. week. And they're going to Abu Dhabi, level on points. I don't, I don't want to think about Max, it, that. Max qualifies P2. Hamilton puts it on pole. The lights drop. They both get a sensational launch. They head up to turn one. Max looks at Lewis and goes, not today, sunshine. Accidentally forgets to break. Both cars out. Both DNF. Max runs the championship because he's had more wins this season. Absolute scenes and Netflix would have a wet dream. Closest championship ever. It's never been decided on level points. It's, yeah, never happened. Half a point is the record. Never zero. God, they must be close on wins though as well. How many of each of them had? So if Hamilton, if, if Hamilton, Hamilton wins, wins this weekend, if Hamilton wins in Abu Dhabi, they'll be level. But so they be, can't. Uh, but they if can't they're level. Then they can't. They can't tie on points and be, both be level on yeah. wins. There's no mathematical scenario where Hamilton can win and they finish level on points. Doesn't it go back to pole positions? Like, it assuming... does. No, no. It, does it? After wins, it goes to pole positions. I does believe. it? I thought yeah. it went. To, I thought it went to seconds. No, no, no. It goes to pole. And Ooh, Max, th- Max has, I'm, Max has I'm, got, so Max Max has got more way poles. more poles. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So there's there's no scenario where that can happen, unfortunately, because that Hamilton be... has to finish ahead. Then Lewis yeah. doesn't need to win the last two, but he. But should. if he does, he's, if he does, he's champion. Yeah. So this is what I mean. I don't think it's essential that you you go into the last race with a lead. All you got to do is go into the race. Um, You've got to go into the last race eight points, uh, so basically within the, the, that pocket, so that if you win and second place gets the fastest lap, they can't win. So, um, so if, we get, if we get into that, so so winning is enough. And currently, mm. if Hamilton wins at the weekend, then winning will be enough. And that's the same for Verstappen. If uh, if they go level on points, then a win will be enough for Verstappen. So I don't think Verstappen will risk anything this weekend but he certainly will next weekend because he's got nothing to lose. If he's behind on track, then he'll sling one up the inside and it will be one of those, well, I don't want us to crash, but if we do, that's on you. Yeah. Yeah, it Le- leaves up to Hamilton to make the decision effectively. God, if, if, we go, if we go in level on points so that, like, to, to Abu Dhabi, like, can someone who's writing the script for this turn, it, turn the drama down a bit to like 10 or 11 out of 10? <laughs> God, that yeah. It honestly, I'm getting, I'm getting tense just thinking about like, those scenarios that we've been throwing out so far. I cannot wait, wait for this. Just, uh, just two weeks to go, pretty much, from when we're recording this. So yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's something. It's it was your Formula One. <laughs> it's Formula One. That's the thing. And you know, as we all know, Formula One is boring and predictable. So there we go. <laughs> You know, which you could never tell by listening to our podcast. Um, but there, yeah, <laughs> there we go. But yeah, those are our predictions. Uh, I'm going to let you guys uh, plug your outlets as well. So, Tom Horace, I've mentioned that you are a part of the Monkey Seat Podcast. What is that, and where can people find it? Yeah, it's Monkey Seat Podcast at Monkey Seat Pods um, on the on the socials, and MonkeySeatPod.com is the website. Uh, we're on all major podcasting platforms. We just talk rubbish about Formula One, two mates having a laugh, chatting through uh, our, our own uh, our own individual views and uh, and some interesting takes from time to time. So yeah, come and give us a listen if you want something a bit more a bit more laid back and a bit more a uh, bit more casual. Yeah, and the good thing about Monkey Seat as well is that they cover other series as well. It's not just Formula One, it's Formula E, uh, Extreme E, Formula Two, Formula Three, when Formula Three is obviously running, it's not. But F2 uh, season decider, I think, well, no, no, it's Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, they've got two more just rounds. Two more rounds. Two more rounds, but yeah, like, as we mentioned, uh, F2 this week, <laughs> this weekend, with, with how those drivers defend, it, it, it could be very interesting on a tight track like Saudi, I'll be honest, but there we go. Um, Tom Downey, I've mentioned that you are a part of the EF1 team. Uh, what is that? And you guys obviously have the uh, the podcast as well. 
Yes, so I'm part of everything everyone, as you can see, wrong hand here. Forgot my forgot my <laughs> images flipped. Um <laughs> you had a 50 50 chance. I know. <laughs> and he also just yeah. picked Schumacher's nose as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um yeah. No, it's, yeah, so I'm yeah, I really feel for our video viewers. Um audio listeners, you don't know what you're missing out on. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm part of everything I've won. So we have the website everything I've won.com. Uh, where you can find articles, race reviews, track guides, all that lovely stuff. Uh, we have big presence on Facebook. Our page has, I think we're up to 26,000 followers now. Um, and we also have our group, Everything F1 Paddock. Uh, we have Instagram and Facebook. They're both at Join EF1. And what else? We have a YouTube channel and a Discord server. Also, obviously, I mentioned we've got the Everything F1 podcast, uh, which... Usually comes, which usually goes out on a Wednesday or a Thursday. You can find that on our website, on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Amazon, all the sort of good podcasting locations. Yeah, definitely check those guys out. They obviously get some uh, big guests on as well onto their show. Uh, very regular with the with the podcast like us as well. So yeah, definitely give uh, the Everything F1 podcast a uh, uh, listen if you've not yet done so. Owain, oh, as the uh, as the as the races are earlier in the day now, the greatest article series on the internet is back. Can you tell us some more about it? Yeah, the resident millennial uh, makes <laughs> meme reviews. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I, I take the young person's look at Formula One uh, every week and, uh, and make sort of a meme article of uh, just recapping the race events usually. Um, but via the format of memes, because it's no fun writing your own articles, uh, writing writing your own uh, recap. Um, sorry, uh, God, I've forgotten the word. It's it's no fun writing your own sort of version of events when you can uh, you know find a meme and it'll tell it in a funny way. Um, so yeah, we take a, I take a look through that every week and uh, and then post it on sportlightpro.com if you uh, if you want to see that. Um, there's one for almost all of the seasons so far, but. Yeah, you know, what with uh, what with the last few, there's uh, there's been a small hiatus, but it's come back. Um, it's slightly worse than before, but do take a look. Oh, talking like a true salesman there, Wade. Fantastic. Um... <laughs> it's bad. Go buy it. <laughs> <laughs> honesty is good, though. Honesty is good. There's there's real integrity to honesty. In 1970s so, um... Ford, all over. <laughs> right so uh let's let's talk about our show as well now obviously i've mentioned that we do have some merchandise that's available on the f1 chronicle uh website just go to f1chronicle.com forward slash store to be able to check out our uh, merchandise uh we, we have t-shirts we have hoodies all that good stuff so go and check that out obviously you can win some of that stuff as well by entering the competition subscribe to the youtube channel comment on the on the video itself and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That's three opportunities you guys have to win some free merchandise. Uh, but obviously, if you do want to support us financially as well, you can uh, get in touch uh, with an order, with our store and order some merchandise on there, as well as go on our Patreon as well. I think we've had our first Patreon subscriber um, come and support the uh, come and support the podcast as well, which is fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, We've just hit 300 subscribers on YouTube as well, so make sure you go on there. We do broadcast the show live as it goes out. You can see it unedited, you can see it completely live, which especially comes in handy for the qualifying reviews and the race reviews as well, because they are right after the race and qualifying sessions pretty much. Uh, We're also available on uh, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Verbal, Omni Studio and Pocket Cast as well. And you can check out our back catalogue of shows as well. Over 150 episodes now to get through. They are all on f1chronicle.com. Uh, and something else I need to mention as well. Now, I wasn't on what any of the uh, the shows around the Qatar Grand Prix uh, last week, but I am on this one, obviously the preview for the for the Saudi Grand Prix. And I got in touch with the other guys on this. And as you can see, the people have uh, who are watching on the video, we've all got the rainbow flags in various forms in our backgrounds as well. And we just want to say that, you know, we support you guys, whatever your views are at the end of the day. And we don't agree basically with uh, Formula One going to countries like Saudi Arabia and like Qatar, it's pretty much illegal to be gay or be anywhere on the LGBT spectrum um, and try and promote this image of we race as one because they just clearly race for the money. I think they just, you know, we race for cash. I think that's what they've kind of parried it as. Um, and the fact that we're going, going to be permanently going to Saudi and Qatar uh, countries that have, let's just say really bad regimes, countries that, 
obviously, I mean, people who have followed football and followed the World Cup stadium being built will know how many workers, quote unquote, I say quote unquote workers because they're not very, they're not paid and they're not exactly going voluntarily either, have died during the construction of that. And to Formula One to, to celebrate, oh, it's a year to go until the Qatar World Cup last week. You know, it just kind of reeks, and I had to say something about it. And I'm glad you guys are obviously with us with, on that one as well. Um, and obviously, uh, everybody at F1 Chronicle, everybody at uh, F1 Grid Talk as well, you know, we, we accept you guys. Just keep being you. Keep doing you at the end of the day. Um, I, didn't write, I didn't really write down a speech for this one. I just kind of this one off the cuff. I hope I got my points across there. If there's anything you guys want to add to that as well, feel free. Very, very well put, George. Couldn't put it better myself. 100% agree. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have anything to add. Just, I just echo everything you just said. Thank you, lads. Do appreciate it. And, uh, and yeah. So we'll be back on Saturday to analyze qualifying for the first Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. And until the next one, goodbye, guys. There we go. Yeah, I, I really should have wrote that in a speech to be honest, but I just thought no, I'll just I'll just it's say it. Didn't need to. It came from the heart, George. That's the yeah, best yeah. Part. Yes, yeah, so, so, oh, sometimes thanks, some, so, something like that is better to come or have it flow naturally like that as opposed to uh, like write something down and yeah. read from the it, script. Because then it sounds rehearsed and that you could tell that was genuinely uh, how you felt and that's better. Yeah. Doing it that oh, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Oh, God. I didn't ask you guys, actually. Did it, I mean, obviously, I know for a Wayne because he was literally at, at here last night, but what about, uh, what about the Toms? It snowed much down where you guys lived. No, not a beat. Really? My um, my wife described it as a dusting earlier, and I said it was more of a garnish than a dusting. It was like a, it was it was like putting parmesan on a hot pizza. It was gone in a second. You know that's that's all it was. So yeah, we had we had a very minor sprinkling. It's not four a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Where George lives, and I'm just there, just like the windscreen won't collect, like the inside of the windscreen, it won't deep uh, de- Oh mist. no! How long were you sat for? Oh, uh, we sat there for at least 20 minutes and it got to the point where it's just oh, like, Jesus. I know, I, I might as well start rolling and, you know. <laughs> just... there, there were no cars around at that time. Oh, no, well, there were some, but it was just sort of creeped down because I was, yeah, there's some sort of steep parts of the hill, but it wasn't mm. actually that bad after a while. Yeah. I remember when I had my 1981 Mini and I used to drive with my head out of the driver's window half the time because it just wouldn't de mist. Oh, God. yeah, it was on flight, it was on full, yeah. like, as hot as it'd go, yeah. like on re- air, air recirculate. Uh, I had the rear rear uh, windscreen demister on, mm. um, but for whatever reason, it would it would it would got a letterbox at the bottom, so it was a bit like yeah. being an LMP1 car, just like yeah. ducking down, just <laughs> like just over the steering wheel. Yeah, 19, 1980s British Leyland engineering was not particularly uh, <laughs> strong on the old demisting, so <laughs> literally just head out the window, just drive like like you're a dog in a motorway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my first car was a 2003 Ford Fiesta that I got for my 17th birthday, 10 years ago, actually. God, I begin to feel old. Um, and it was, uh, and it, it, it had Ford's like rapid defrost thing, but it only worked on the passenger side. Oh, so the, so the so, driver's so, side was just completely fogged still. Yeah. So, so the driver's side. Of- yeah, so the driver's side would take an absolute fucking age to, to defrost. And the passenger side was like, bum, I'm done. And I was like, fuck's sake, man, I'm trying to drive. And I just drive like Mr. Bean or something, just sit around a fucking roof for a while. And they designed it for the American market. Well, I, well, I, well, I was wondering if it was possibly like a slightly more European thing, because obviously it was all supposed to be left-hand, you know, it's usually left-hand drive. So That's probably wondering. it, yeah. That's probably it. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable last night up here. Like, there's still a lot of snow around outside up here. It's not really cleared that much through the day, but like, in a way, will back me up on this as well. We had thunder snow, thunder thunderstorm. Snow. Yeah, a thunderstorm God, and was... snow at the same well, time. It was bizarre. It's the sort of thing you don't want to be out in. <laughs> no, it was so honestly because I, when I was taking Jarrett home, obviously I had to go via. Like it's wakey, out, yeah, yeah, out, yeah, out sort of uh, up through the top of there. It was so like it was just a crosswind the entire time. It was so windy. But at least when you pull onto a fast road, you can say "punch it, Chewie" and pretend you're on the Millennium Falcon. Oh uh, yeah, well, I mean, t- <laughs> see the thing. The thing about it was with the, all the snow coming down, it looked like the uh, it looked like the rain from the GTA definitive definitive editions. If you know what that looks like, God, that, that's apparently awful. But, but, oh, very poor, poor, poor remasters of games. <laughs>
Indeed. <laughs> but, oh, I think I got above 40 miles an hour the entire way there. Bearing in mind part of that road is 60, I was just like, I am not going any faster than that. Sensible, sensible. Quite a few rainbow flags and uh, rainbows themselves in the in the chat as well. Tom, uh, Connor Walker, of course, and uh, Ruby putting them in there. So thanks, guys, for that. Thanks for listening. Um, got a question from Connor as well. Bit of an off-topic question, but do you guys think Alonso could still compete for a championship if he was in a top-tier car after his recent performance? Yeah, easy. Yeah. I think I think he could do. Yeah, I think it yeah. depends on his his teammate. I think I think someone like Hamilton would definitely beat him or Verstappen in the same car. But it, it, I mean, obviously, he can beat people like Ocon, who are you know race winners now. So he's you know he's he's still up there. Yeah, is Ocon a race winner though? He's he's Ocon has won a race. He's not a race winner, if that makes sense. He's yeah, <laughs> in a not race really, where, not really, but I know what you mean. Yeah, in a yeah. race where 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 Bottas can t- can uh, can effectively take out uh, everyone except for Hamilton, and then Hamilton ends up at the back by a country mile, but due to a botched uh, strategy, uh, yes, he can win that race, but uh, he's not a race winning driver yet. So I do think he's got potential, Ocon, but. Alonso has definitely got the edge over him on, on, on based on performance, and you know, considering that the the uh, the 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 inflation that that's done to his overall points tally over the season, Ocon and uh, Fernando is still so much ahead of him, and just seems to have have that car nailed much more than he does. Uh, yes, Alonso can definitely still fight for a championship. He, you know, you don't lose that kind of class. And when Schumacher came back, I know there's a lot of talk about that, but. Um, Schumacher, if Mercedes had been the dominant car, uh, yeah, if he'd have had a slightly better 2013, then or 2012, sorry, then perhaps you know he he does stick on for another couple of years and does win another race into 2013, or you know dare I say even win another championship in 2014. It's it's certainly possible. I have my oh. doubts as to when he would have beaten Rosberg overall, but you give drivers like Schumacher, Hamilton, Alonso, Verstappen, you give them a car that's you know, that that's close to the best car on the grid, they're going to get the best out of it. And mm. if they get beaten by a lesser teammate in a lesser car, you know, I'm probably going to get a lot of hate mail for this. But for example, Button beat Hamilton over their three years together. He, he amassed more points than Hamilton did over those three years together. Um, that's because the car wasn't as competitive as it could have been. And, uh, and you put them both in a championship winning car and Hamilton wins probably eight out of 10 championships between him and Button. And the same will go with Alonso mm. and, and most drivers on the grid. It's only when you've got people like Hamilton, Verstappen, Alonso all in the same car, that's when you get the fireworks. That's when you get your, you know, your 2007s and, uh, and, uh, and early hybrid years with Hamilton and, and Rosberg was such a performance advantage yet that you couldn't separate them. So yeah, uh, lo- long story short, yes, he's definitely still got a championship in him if he's in the correct car, but uh, or the mm. best car. But I'm not certain Alpine are going to create a scenario where he can win a championship. Um, but I mean, I heard an interview with him a few days ago where he's, he's he expects to stay in Formula One for at least another year or two after his current deal. So who knows if Alpine get it together, he may well get another championship. Could you imagine? Would he would, would he would surely be like the the um you know the, the driver who has the longest gap between his championships because yes yeah, currently Nicky Lauda Lauda yeah because because Lauda was what seventy seven to about eighty four or something oh yeah yeah hundred yeah. percent yeah I mean it's it's yeah. been it's it's, it's been been longer than Lauda's Formula One career since he last won his championship well so yeah because yeah, definitely yeah, yeah, yeah it's fifteen years ago and, and we're really looking at what we'd be looking at what eighteen years seventeen years yeah. So you can't write off Alonso. Like you're putting in no. anything, everything I've ever seen him in, he's driven the wheels off of it. He's just an extremely naturally talented driver. He's a bit like Andre, isn't he? You know, he can yeah, just, just put him in anything, he'll win. Like the, really the only a chance of winning. The only t- like 2005, 2006, yeah, he, you know, he he obviously had the the fastest car for at least one of those years. 2007, he lost it on his head. Like that's that's the only the only person that can beat Fernando is Fernando a lot of the time. You know, so he, you know, he lost it there. He then went into an uncompetitive Renault, and still, under dubious circumstances, but bearing in mind the likelihood of a safety car at Singapore, he probably would have ended up winning anyway. Uh, you know, that season uh, in, 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 in a not particularly good Renault. Um, oh, where did he move to? He went to Ferrari, and he, uh, you know, he spent uh, a few years at Ferrari, dragging, dragging that prancing horse over the line. Uh, and that, so where did he spend? No, he spent twenty two thousand and nine at Renault, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eight, yeah. He spent yeah. Eight, eight and nine at Renault, then to Ferrari in two thousand and ten. 
Yeah, and got that. And, and, and then back to McLaren in twenty fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. After And yeah, he was he were yeah, he was within a chance of winning two championships at Ferrari comfortably. You know, he's like five points away from being a five time world champion or something ridiculous. So mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just unbelievable talent, isn't he? Um, the only thing that's not on his side is his age. That's the only thing. Because even like you we mentioned about uh, Michael Schumacher just before, what was he when he retired the second time? Forty three, something like that. Yeah, Alonso's not far off that. I think he's forty now, isn't he? So yes, he is. He's yeah. wanting to stay on another another two years after his current deal. He's probably going to be about forty three when he retires. Yeah. So after that, it's like, can you still? be the same I mean obviously you're extremely experienced but can you still compete with the relative young guns at that age I'm not so sure I don't think over a whole season it'd be very difficult to do it but who knows I mean Fangio was in his uh, late 40s I think when he retired very different era of course but it's possible I think one of the things it's the same with Alonso that um that all the great champions sort of bring to the team is that uh, bring to uh, every team they go to is that they raise the level of the team. You know, mm. I, I've heard stories of him going when he went to Toyota. You know, he was he was demanding things that they change there to to make them better. And he, you know, you, they raise that level. And you know, the same thing when it, you know, it's just one of those things that people like the you know the Schumachers, Alonso's, Hamiltons, and that they just make everyone else perform better. Um, and I'm not sure there's but what about what about Alonso when he was at McLaren the second time though? That's the only thing I'd say with that because the second time at McLaren, I don't you know it's a tough one because he did I don't think he helped things there, I'll be honest. No, <laughs> well, well, I mean look at Alonso in was it 2016 when he was driving around um was it Japan when he was it was 2015 G- and he oh, did it was 2015 it at GP2, Japan. GP2 engine. Oh no, yeah. Alonso's the master of Advertising his off. feelings at the the best moment. <laughs> yeah, it's like in Honda's home race, you, you're gonna you're gonna sit there and just basically call their engine shite, which yeah. it wasn't brilliant at the time, but hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It certainly uh, drove them to to make changes, and probably in the end was part of the reason why they decided to pull out. But uh, it certainly drove them to changes. Yeah. Um, can we pick up on some of the Connors put in the chat again about Sebastian Vettel? That'd be quite an interesting topic to discuss. Sure. Let's have a look. Vettel. I've not seen. I'm really not sure with Vettel. He's not got. I think the thing about you know about Alonso and about um, you know a number of those drivers that have come, but like you know, I think there's sort of two types of driver that can win a world championship. You've got your Senna ilk, where you know massive talent behind the wheel, and I'm not saying that the other sort of class of drivers doesn't have that um, that talent, but I just mean the sort of killer instinct for an overtake and things mm. like that. You know, pure racing qualifying speed. Um, and things like that. Whereas I think Vettel's more of the ilk of he's very good at controlling a race and maybe the, uh, in the same way that sort of Prost was or something like that, where you don't have to be the fastest, but, um, you know, sorry, the absolute fastest, but they'd finish more quickly, if that makes any kind of sense. Put themselves um, in a good position, basically, I, to I, win. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Vettel needs a decently good car to really... Uh, you know, you know, a certain level of car to, to really perform pr- uh, properly well. Um, you know, we, we you saw once that once the car went downhill at Ferrari, is is he sort of f- fell off? It was almost like you lost confidence in the car. Whereas, I think maybe someone like Hamilton think can believe that well, the car will do it because I'm good enough that I can make the car do it. I think Vettel is uh, is an interesting one, but I, I liken him a lot to drivers like Bottas and Button in that if everything's right, then they're unbeatable. And Bottas has shown at times when he when he qualifies well, gets off to a good start, and the car suits him, he can dominate races. And you know, if he had been in the uh, in the Mercedes Turbo Hybrids in twenty fourteen to twenty sixteen, I think he would have had a, he would, certainly would have got one championship over Hamilton. No, Hamilton sorry. Hamilton got a lot stronger in twenty sixteen as a result of how Rosberg dealt with him. And I think Bottas may have may have had the edge over one championship over those three years, or certainly. In a uh, with in a Red Bull situation between 2010 and 2013, gotta love Mark Webber, but he never won a championship in his entire career, and there's a reason for that. And when he's up against Sebastian Vettel, just just the edge there in in a car that's planted, that's got a nice solid rear end that you can just drive and drive through corners and and drive um, drive the wheels off it. Um, but equally as well, Vettel has shown he can be 
ruthless in overtakes. You've only got to look at the Brazilian Grand Prix and was it 2012 when he got spun by um, when he got spun by Bruno, Bruno Senna. Senna and ended up at the back and came back through. That was a phenomenal with performance. a damaged car as well. Yeah, yeah, amazing yeah. performance from him in that race. And you know, he he was genuinely the fastest guy on that track at various points that year and fully deserves to have at least a handful of at least two, maybe three championships. Four probably flatters him slightly, uh, just given the dominance that car had and the fact that his teammate wasn't really up to the same level as him. Again, Australians, please don't at me. It's just my opinion, and my opinions are my own. But uh, yeah, I, so Vettel wise, yeah, if Formula One comes to Vettel and he's in the right place at the right time, he can dominate races. If Aston Martin come out with a with a phenomenal package, yes, he can win another championship, and yes, he can be there. But I do question his mentality slightly now, given that you know he blew his chance with Ferrari, um, and then when he's got a young charger alongside him, he doesn't seem to do so well. You know, case in point, Daniel Ricciardo, Charles Leclerc, um, yeah, Lance Stroll, he's fine with. You know, take from that what you will. <laughs> um, chaps, I'm gonna have to bounce as well. Okay. No worries, mate. Sorry, sorry to, for coming on. Sorry, sorry to make it an abrupt ending. I've got to go. It's all right. That's all right. All right. No. See you right. I will. Bye, yeah. Catch you in a week. Ta-da. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't know. I don't know about Vel. This is the thing. I I generally like the guy. I'm very glad he's in Formula One, and I want to see him do well at Aston Martin. But yeah, winning a championship, I I just think it might be a bridge too far for him. But at the same time. If, if he gets a top car again, why not? He's shown he can do it. He's, you know, he's quick. He's is, putting some he incredible to, performances though? this season, I think. He doesn't need to. Yeah, that's it's the what, need. What is there to prove? It? Like, you've won four world championships. And and, and and he did not have it all his own way in twelve and in 2010 and 2012. Mm. Um, you know, tw- to be honest, 2012, McLaren lost themselves the championship that year. They had the fastest car yeah. probably all season and just... They kept that they they just you know whether it was Lewis being off his game, you know not being in a comfortable place, Jensen, you know not doing so well either. You know the fact the that cars are unreliable as well. Yeah, and the car oh, the car, the car the being so times. unreliable, which is which is baffling in some ways. In that you know Mercedes are, you know Mercedes has been so reliable, and, and at that point I think they were in the middle of an engine freeze. I think it was an engine freeze by that point. So it was it just was, yeah. so it's just like. As people have said, McLaren blew it that year. They absolutely, they they could have won the championship easily. Uh, you know, they that, that was, and, and yet, you know, a, a Fernando Alonso in a in a in an awful Ferrari, awful awful Ferrari, mm. uh, you know, couldn't you know manage to beat them. Which is that I think that's all that you need to know, like about that season and. You know, yet yeah, Vettel still won, came and won it. So you, you'd you'd certainly appreciate this, given your uh, your your meme lord status. Uh, just uh, I remember seeing this this image of, uh, of Fernando Alonso dragging a black dead horse across a finish line. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely a uh, definitely a good analogy of for Ferrari season. God, yeah, it, it was that Ferrari was so bad, like genuinely. I think it was probably down though, like the Sauber for most of the season. I mean, the Sauber had a good car that season by their standard, but you know, it's it, yeah. It's a testament to Fernando Alonso though that he could qualify awfully on a Saturday, just really badly on a Saturday, and then make up all the positions he needed to on a Sunday. Just fresh the wheels off it, wasn't he? A week after it's unbelievable. He was the he was without a doubt the most consistent guy that season. Like like. Without the Grosjean crash, without the collision with Raikkonen in, in Suzuka, only, I was going to say two people ran into him. Took. Two people ran into him, and that's the only reason that he didn't like he, he didn't win the championship. And there's oh, like is he was that close? He was that close to winning it, and that's the most uh, the most influence any Russian has ever had in Formula One. Vitaly Petrov. <laughs> oh God. Oh, oh man. That season, am I right in saying that Vettel only led the championship in one round and that was the final yeah. round? Yeah, the first time he led the championship was when he crossed the line in Abu Dhabi to win it. Because <laughs> it was so it was weird. all Weber. And it was all just he, because Weber, he, it was like Weber binned it in, in, uh, in Korea. South Korea. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and Ferrari just basically did what Hamilton did at the weekend, Mercedes did at the weekend, where they just shadowed Weber because Weber was the one most likely to win the championship. And then Vettel just tootles on through to win the championship out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. 
He was very lucky in 2010. This was alluded to earlier. He was very lucky in 2010 to win that championship. But you know, having having read the uh, Aussie Grit uh, book and various other stories about that that time, he was definitely the favoured of the two, and he definitely you know he was he was the future. Whereas Weber, you know, as I said before, mentality could be questioned given that he's never he was never able to win a championship in any series. It was just fascinating listening to his. Um, Reading his book and and uh, and hearing all the stories about how he almost won things and there's I think there's a reason why he just never had the mentality to win a championship and that's kind of part of the reason why Vettel was so inflated. It's it's baffling to me that it, like I I, I I I was rewatching just seeing the points tallies coming up to that last race and and for Sebastian Vettel was like twenty points behind I think. I think it was Sebastian Vettel was 20 points behind at some, at one point or in fourth place in the championship, mm. like three rounds to go or something, two rounds to go, maybe even going into the final round. And yet, you know, we went to Abu Dhabi and just everything went on its head. Yeah, it's very, it was very Kimmy 2007, wasn't it? <laughs> Kimmy yeah, shouldn't have won 2007. Kimmy shouldn't have won 2007. Like, I, I watch old races and uh, every so often. And, you know, sometimes you just think, Right, there were n number of times for the person who came second in that championship to to win, yeah. like to, to to just take it, just steal enough points. Bearing in mind, you know, Fernando Alonso has lost by one or two points on a numerous occasions. Kimi did deserve one championship, though I'd say, because he was he was the quickest driver in Formula One for a couple of years in McLaren. I don't think mm. he deserved to win one for Ferrari, but he certainly deserved to win at least one for McLaren. So two thousand and three, I think, probably yeah. should have won it that year. Two thousand and five. Yeah. They were close he would to have won it if they were. Yeah, I think he would have won it that year if the car was more reliable. That the Renault was just there on the podium with Alonso every race, and that's what's yeah. won it. Yeah. So it's inter- it's weird, isn't it? Like, yeah, I agree. I think he deserved to win the championship more in 0- 03 and 05 than he did in 07. But and results the same. You could I think argue, if you still win the roundabouts. I think if you win a championship, you definitely deserve to win it no matter what. But there's there's definitely more deserving drives that people have yeah. made. I mean, I, it's not too often that I agree with Christian Horner, but coming back to Mark, but uh, Mark Webber, I think the thing was that you know, um, you know, basically people are saying, well, it's just the car, it's just the car about Vettel, and this was like sort of 2013, it, um, and it was just like, yeah, but we run two cars, you know, and one, you know, and, and, you know, and one when uh, one uh, one eleven races or thirteen races or something, and the other one's no idiot. Like it's the same thing with it was the same thing with uh, 2014 with um, Lewis and Rosberg, like Hamilton and Rosberg. It was like you know one won eleven races and the other one won five. Mm. I, I, I never understand the thing of when, when people say it's just the car because there, there, there's another guy in that too. Exactly, exactly. I mean, we sit and we see with Hamilton and Bottas now. The difference between those two is incredible. I mean. What's what's Hamilton got this year? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven wins, and Bottas has one, and that's one of Bottas's better ratios. I mean, what what was it last year? Like Hamilton won eleven, and Bottas got one or two. There's been bigger like swings than that as well, because we only had seventeen races last year. I think Hamilton's won ten races in a season, and I don't think Bottas got any. I'm sure think... that's one year. One year he won he won double figures in races, and Bottas didn't get any. Might have been 2018. It probably would have been 2018 or 2019. Well, Bottas was a bit unlucky in that he got told to move over at Russia. Yeah. Is that, but yeah. still, that's, even then, that's one. I mean, I mean, yeah. he did, but you know, he wouldn't be in that position had he uh, yeah. had a bit like managed to compete better at the like. You, you've got to compete within one or two races. Like, there's no, mm. there's numerous championships where Bottas has been in the Mercedes and won the first race. Yeah, you know, it happened yeah, last Australia, year. It happened Australia last year. eighteen was it? I think he won the it, first race. It happened last year. It happened yeah. Australia eighteen. Like. There's, there's numerous times. 2019, where, yeah, as well, I think. Yeah, like if you win the first yeah. race like, or, or, or go better than your teammate in your first race, then surely you've got the the better chance to, you know, have people move over for you. And yet, you know, you, you give it four, three or four races, maybe five, and by that point, Bottas is behind. So It's the, just the consistency, though. It's, so no wonder he's getting told to move over. Yeah, Allison's consistency over a season is just unbelievable. Like the lengths that Rosberg went to to beat Hamilton in 2016, no wonder the guy retired. He just he was just spent. If he went back, if he came back in 2017, he would he would have just been a, a husk of his born, former self, really. He would have been absolutely just drained. 
Because the the, lem- the lengths that he went to, yeah, just I, unreal. The dedication he put in, and he only just beat him in the end. In what I think is one of Hamilton's worst uh, seasons. Not a bad season by any stretch, but by his standards, he, he did make some mistakes. Oh yeah, well, I mean, it and was a lot that. of reliability as well. I mean, on the so, fa- yeah. on the face of it, the reliability was actually worse for Rosberg than Hamilton in the races, which does shock you to think about. But when you look at the amount of problems that Hamilton had in practice and qualifying, which then which then caused him problems in races. So he was starting like seventh and Rosberg was on pole and stuff, you know, because of his engine penalties and, and various other problems and starting from the back to come back to a podium. He had far more race compromised or compromised races than Rosberg did, but Rosberg technically had the worst reliability that year. Mm. Yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't a hell of a lot of in it, in it reliability. It's just the Malaysia one that stands out to a lot of people. Yeah. God, that's that what one. decided it. I was going to say, the Malaysia one was just like, you can just sit where you hear him saying on the radio, no. Yeah, <laughs> that still cuts deep, that one, doesn't it? God. All these years later. I don't want to make it into the Lewis Hamilton show, but I think the difference is, like, you know, you say all the dis- all the lengths that Rosberg had to go to to win the championship in 16, and people make, you know, people question Lewis's jet set lifestyle, and they have done for about the last... Well, ever since he was a Formula One driver, yeah, <laughs> however, how, people have been criticizing him for what he does off the track since yeah. he joined the sport. Yeah, so you know, however many years, you know, and he's been with round with fashion designers and music industry professionals and blah 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 blah. You know, not necessarily doing it the way that a lot of people want to, and he can still turn up on a Friday and uh, and just wipe the floor with the field sometimes. And I think that's <laughs> that's a testament to some drivers over others, where you know one can just get in and do it without having to do the simulate the level of simulated training, without having to do the track walks and all that sort of stuff. And yet, you know, one, uh, and yet some people have to do all of that and still don't get anywhere close. Mm. Yeah, it's a real testament to the guy. He's, he's incredible. We'll definitely sorely miss him when he goes eventually. Well, yeah, uh, speaking of going, I think, uh, I think I'll call I was it say, there. I've got, I've got to go and feed a cat. So, <laughs> oh, Tom, you, you might said, have to do the same You, you said things. that and you woke him up, look. Oh no. oh no! I said the words. <laughs> said the oh, C no. word. Nope. Oh no! <laughs> He's been very good today, haven't you? Oh. He's been very good. Oh yeah. Anyway, yes. All right, lads. Well, I'll put on the uh, grid talk uh, Slack tomorrow when the sessions are going to be and stuff for the next weekend. Three shows. Yay! Oh. Yeah, back to backs. I was going to say it's the last. Set. It's the, sorry, the last five shows. The last mm. five shows of the season. So, yeah. Well, we got three and then two and then. Yeah, and then it's yeah. We're gonna have a, I think we'll have a little break. A little <laughs> break after that because we're in Christmas almost. That's how late the season is. Yeah. Like I said yesterday, oh, twenty-three races is lovely as a fan, but it's awful if you cover it in any way. Hundred percent, hundred percent. We'll we'll come back for a special one, two or three weeks after, like best drivers or yeah. something like that, as we usually do. But yeah, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have some well earned time off over Christmas. 69 regular season shows we've had. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, no, it's not 22 races, 66. My bad. It's, no, it's 23. It changed. No, it's 22 this year now. Is it 22? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's supposed to be 23, to... but we lost Japan and didn't, didn't replace it. Uh, well, 22 okay. now. God damn. Yeah. So Still, close. Sorry, 22. I think, oh, Next I year, know. though. Does it matter? Do, oh, don't you say that. <laughs> next year though that's got 22 races I think as it stands so we'll see what happens with that alright lads well take care enjoy the rest of your weekend Tom will be 